Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here this week with uh, Andrew Stone of Bitcoin Unlimited. I'm George Donnelly. This is the Bitcoin Cash Site Builder interview for uh, December fifteenth, twenty twenty. Andrew, how are you doing today? Good. All right. So, Andrew, uh, you are uh, part of Bitcoin Unlimited. Can you tell us, yep. uh, for those of people who aren't familiar with Bitcoin Unlimited, can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, well, we were, I founded it in, um, around 2015 to attempt to, uh, increase the, uh, block size on, uh, Bitcoin, right? And we, uh, you know, in conjunction with our minor partners, um, managed to get approximately 50% of the mining power at that time. And then we, um, with SegWit coming and conversations with certain miners, it was pretty obvious that further mining power was not going to arrive. So, you know, we wrote a, um, uh, so Bitcoin Unlimited is a democracy, right? So people vote. So we wrote a proposal to um, do a fork and that proposal was um, authenticated and, um, you know, Bitcoin Cash was essentially the result, although Bitcoin ABC kind of, you know, took the flag and was running with it for many years and deserves a lot of credit for that. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, we're an organization that is uh, democratic and we've been around since the beginning, basically. Yeah. So Bitcoin uh, Unlimited is kind of the, uh, you know, an OG uh, group, uh, a collective, perhaps, uh, of many people, many developers who are very prominent in uh, Bitcoin Cash. And I remember Bitcoin Unlimited uh, back in the day, you know, attempting to to get, you know, Bitcoin BTC, Bitcoin Core, essentially now to uh, to adopt big blocks, you know, which is the, yep. the defining for those who aren't familiar, kind of a defining issue, still sort of a defining issue in the Bitcoin space. So uh, Bitcoin Unlimited is kind of kind of a hero in this space, really. Um, so what, what are you doing these days at uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, you know, what's your role? What are you working on? T and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm the, uh, the lead developer, which means that I, uh, you know, uh, well, you can read the articles to discover my exact powers, but essentially, you know, I have control over merges um, and uh, code quality and um, to some degree, um, you know, inform the direction that Bitcoin Unlimited goes, but at the same time, um, the majority of the direction is chosen by uh, our members. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in particular, if you wanna see what Bitcoin Unlimited is doing, accessing those BUIPs is the best idea. But, um, you know, in the uh, past few years, we've been focusing on Bitcoin Cash, but without a lot of hash power, our strategy has been to focus on technology. Okay, so to find those uh, BUIPs, which are Bitcoin Unlimited Improvement Proposals, they visit, is that the, do they visit BitcoinUnlimited.info or where, where can people get, find that? So that'll get you there. There's also a GitHub repository. And then recently on BitcoinUnlimited.net, I've put kind of like a, a synopsis where I give the status of different BUIPs and, you know, their implementation status. So you can look there. Um, and then we also have, um, bitco.in, which is our kind of forum where you hop on and the members argue about the different BYPs that are being proposed. Okay. So is anybody welcome to join there or is it just for members or how does that work? You know, for those new people who may join... want to get involved. Yes. Anyone is welcome to join the forum and jump in and make comments. Absolutely. Um, in terms of actually proposing BYPs, you need to either be a member or the BYP needs to be sponsored by a member. But you can certainly, okay. you know, put an idea out there in our forum and then, you know, look for a, a member to sponsor. And that's actually happened many times. Okay, excellent. So I, I noticed during this year of uh, 2020 that BU, for the most part, seemed to be rather rather quiet, a bit on the sidelines, um, you know, correct me if I got that impression wrong. But now, uh, now that, you know, the whole ABC, the whole network upgrade thing seems to be uh, behind us, I see BU coming forward again with, 
with uh, proposals like um, Op Group. Uh, you guys are doing a podcast now. Uh, co- the Coin Party Hackathon, which is going to take place uh, in about a month. Yep. Um, so what's 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 the motivation? What's the thinking? What's the rationale behind this new um, uh, resurgence in acti- activity? I hate to say too much bad about our history, right? But obviously there was significant friction with ABC Group who drove um, the SV, you know, N-Chain, let's call it N-Chain before there was an SV away from the industry who drove XT away. So our strategy was to kind of take a back seat and wait ABC out, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I felt like the community was only going to accept this kind of crap for so long. Um, So having waited it out, um, you know, we are now intending to take a slightly more active role. Um, We still are not um, a mining, you know, a full node with a significant amount of hash power. So I think that our role is more going to be just laying ideas out there. And if Bitcoin Cash as a community, you know, chooses to adopt those ideas, then great. Right. But if they don't, then, you know, at least we explored uh, the ideas. Okay. And then, of course, you know, the, the the hackathon and everything, you know, just, you know, we can do that and build up, you know, excitement around Bitcoin Cash, right? And any no one's going to, you know, everyone likes that, right? So, yeah, you mentioned that uh, the um, BU uh, full node, which is called Bitcoin Cash Unlimited now, right? Which is kind BCH of... BCH Unlimited. BCH Unlimited. So that's in the mm-hmm. same camp that serves the kind of the same purpose as other full nodes like uh bitcoin cash node flowy knuth right um right so do you have any plans to uh to get miners to start using bch unlimited uh well you know we have significant numbers of full nodes out that are running right we just don't think that miners are using them but to be honest it's actually pretty much impossible to tell what miners are using right uh and sure there is a coinbase uh you know string but do understand that um even though the full node like supplies a coinbase to the mining infrastructure uh you know mining pools essentially just rip that entire coinbase transaction off and put their own in right so you know a full like a mining infrastructure could be running anything under the hood and we don't know however let's let's be rational about this and think hey you know the miners seem to have um gone with uh, bitcoin cash node and you know I, I don't personally see like the need to run out there and try and steal mining power from bitcoin cash node like what's the point right um and then, and then do what? Like if we got a lot of hash power, like force our ideas into the community and we could have another split, this doesn't seem to make any sense, right? So, um, you know, if miners um, would like to run um, Bitcoin Unlimited or more uh, like in a better way, a multi-node solution, I would be super excited to, you know, help and consult with them to do that. I think Josh Green of Bitcoin Verde also would be excited to do that because he's working on some technologies under that to make that happen. And if you do that, your infrastructure is going to be uh, stronger um, in terms of uh, software failures, right? So, you know, I think that's perhaps uh, your best choice as a miner. But of course, if you know, you look at um, some of the technologies that Bitcoin Unlimited is proposing, and you like them, then mining with Bitcoin Unlimited would be a strong signal that you like those technologies. All right. And uh, you guys, there are a lot of BU nodes out there, right? They're just not mm-hmm. not necessarily or not all of them, or we're not really sure quite how many of them are actually being used by miners. But these nodes, I've been told, play an important role uh, in the network 
Uh, can you can you expand on that? Can you tell us about that? Well, there are exchanges. There are, um, it, you know, uh, explorers. There are just tons of other uses for full nodes, right? There are individuals who are, you know, um, maintaining the network, who are supplying and, uh, you know, wallets with uh, transaction information, right? So, um, you know, websites like coin.dance, right? All these, these entities need full nodes, right? And also it's a good policy as one of those companies to run more than one full node, both to kind of hide your full node from DOS attacks, right? And also if someone is to, you know, is capable of identifying your full node, you can quickly switch to one that you may have hidden, you know, that might be not be co-located running on, it might be running on Amazon somewhere or something, right? So I think for all those reasons, that might be why Bitcoin Unlimited has a bunch of full nodes running out there. Cool, excellent. So what, uh, you know, what do you see um, as, I don't know, how, how, let me uh, backtrack. How do you see the state of the Bitcoin Cash community right now? You know, post the <laughs> November 15th network upgrade. upgrade. Where, where do you see us? Where do you see the vibe? How do you think people are feeling? Let me turn that around to you and ask, like what how successful are you at like uh you know boots on the ground type um advocacy and signing people up very very that said you know like let's say we're talking about merchant adoption uh i can visit uh 40 stores uh 40 you know brick and mortar places in about two and a half hours and i might get if i get two that's very good. You know, if I get two to say yes, that's very good. Um, you know, before when we were doing events, um, at, in the beginning, it was very hard getting that off the ground. But after a while, it became a machine and we had no problem getting people to come out um, and, and getting them excited. In fact, we had people lined up. Um, so why though? Like what are they excited about about bitcoin cash like bitcoin obviously has this big store of value sales model which bitcoin cash also does but until you know we have more use than bitcoin bitcoin is going to be the gold and we're going to be like um the rhodium right it's rarer than gold but it's not it's not money right <laughs> Uh, well, here's the thing out where, where I do my work, which I consider to mm -hmm. be the most promising area is the developing world. And here, uh, most people have never heard of Bitcoin. So whereas, you know, those of us who have been in this for a while are like, you know, uh, BCH versus ADA versus Monero versus this, they don't think about that. They just see that there's this new money and this new payment system and, um, and that is interesting. The ability to try out something new on its own and to learn something new and to have uh, a, a little bit more uh, freedom uh, in the economic sense, for example, from banks and whatnot. That's it. That's interesting. I see. Okay. Well, that is good, right? Um, what, what I feel like, and I think some of your narrative is maybe putting this into question a little bit is um, that you guys actually have a hard sell, right? Because um, I'm looking for like a compelling use case for a cryptocurrency, right? And of course, Bitcoin with its store of value in an inflationary system, that is a compelling use case. We wanna focus on day-to-day um, -day use, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Marketing is hard. Like if, if marketing is um, just sort of letting people know that something exists and then they obviously, you know, if, if it's just about knowledge, right? Marketing is easy. If you have to convince someone that your technology actually solves a problem that they didn't know they had, that's a lot harder, right? Yes. Um, but what I'm hearing in your voice is that people are aware of certain problems and how Bitcoin Cash will solve that. I personally think that at the you know development and engineering level, we need to try and solve more problems. 
uh, to give you guys the tools you need to have more people say, oh, I totally want to use this because it solves this specific problem, right? So now your, your you know, job simply becomes um, awareness, not, you know, like strong advocacy. Um, but maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe, um, I, I feel like in the last three years, this is what it's been like. We've been around for three years. I don't see a huge amount of adoption happening, right? My feeling mm -hmm. is that that is because we don't have a compelling problem that we solve yet, right? Mm. But it sounds to me like in the developing world, you are actually getting traction, which is great news. Well, the, the thing is that financial exclusion is a huge deal here. People mm. are locked out of, of the banking system. Like, for example, in Colombia, 65% of jobs are in the informal economy. And that's right. that's a that's a you know the number is right around there in in many parts of the developing world, the inf informal economy exists because governments and corporations have made it incredibly challenging and expensive to participate in a formal economy the way that we know it in the developed world, and so um, you know and they've had plenty of chances to fix this, uh, you know we can we can bypass all of their restrictions. And in that sense, the use case is cash. Of course, cash seems too general, right? It's or it takes two to like um problem with bootstrapping that as cash is your new convert goes and tries to spend something with Bitcoin cash, right? And is unable to do so because they have to convince that person, right? And then the next person. Um Originally, what I thought a great use for cryptocurrencies would be would be like recurring um, payments between two small businesses, because then you spend all the time to convince, you know, your business partner to take Bitcoin cash. And then, you know, every week you you make your payment. Right. Mm -hmm. um, versus direct peer to peer is a lot harder because, you know, today you're talking to this person. Tomorrow you want to pay that person. So it becomes difficult. Right. But anyway, from a development perspective, I'm relatively far away from that. And so in order to make a difference in terms of adoption, what I want to focus on and Bitcoin Unlimited to focus on is technologies that might make your job easier, right? And that would be to create additional outlets where people could say, ooh, that's something cool that I really want to do with my currency, right? Whatever that idea happens to be. So from my perspective, that means broadening the base functionality of um, the cryptocurrency. I think that's definitely, you know, like we need to be firing on multiple cylinders. And so while some of us are out there marketing and are, others are creating media and, um, you know, others are building partnerships and integrations, I think we definitely need to think about how to improve the base functionality, just like you said. Yeah. So so what what would you say is your main proposal or main development thrust along those lines, say for 2021? Well, I feel um, I would like to investigate, um, you know, effectively um, tokens and smart contracts as a combination, right? Ethereum um, has shown that there's a large market um, and we would not become like Ethereum. The, the idea is absolutely not to transform Bitcoin Cash into a distributed computer, right? The idea mm -hmm. would be to create a distributed financial system with limited smart contract capabilities. So what I'm talking about, for example, is, you know, allowing contracts to have access to all the information that the full node already has to uh, and it needs to validate a transaction, right? Mm -hmm. um, so not like the, that the, that the, you know, like in Ethereum, the, um, the transaction can access, you know, any contract on the currently on the blockchain anywhere. Right. So, you know, it has these huge data requirements. The intention for something like Bitcoin cash would be, you know, a much more limited uh, scope and is effectively access the data that we already have, you know, we already have to load up in order to validate the transaction. And that would allow you to do a lot of things. So like I would ask users, people to think about like, um, 
you know, the language that the scripting language that underlies uh, Bitcoin as a natural language, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and if you think that that there shouldn't be tokens in Bitcoin Cash, why don't you walk around all day and only talk about one thing? Like, uh, let's just say, um, I don't know, pencils. Okay, so every statement that you make has to be only and exclusively about pencils, right? How much communication can you do, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to make an argument that a language needs nouns, right? You need more than just one thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then you also need verbs, right? We need to be able to talk about the transaction that we're, that we're executing right now. We need those verbs. With nouns and verbs, uh, we have something that can build uh, pretty good smart contracts. If we have nouns and not verbs, eh, you can do tokens, you can do like um, uh, like uh, tickets, right? And cool things like that. But I couldn't um, create a system that says something like this. Um, you know, uh, ticket sellers, they really don't like ticket scalpers, right? You know, they don't like mm -hmm. people reselling their tickets. But what if they could write a smart contract that gave them 2% of it every time the ticket was sold. That might change their their opinion of, you know, resale of tickets significantly, right? So, Definitely. you know, with, with tokens and smart contracts, you could write a, a system like that. You might catch the eye of, you know, um, yeah, you, now you're suddenly offering a feature that doesn't exist in standard ticket sales, right? Uh, that might catch someone's eye. And that might be the sort of functionality that you could go off and really sell, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, so you, so if you have verbs and no nouns too, uh, you know, you can't really um, have a complete language either, right? So I do feel like, uh, you know, I would like to investigate anyway, creating a language on you know, the Bitcoin technologies, right? The Satoshi code base that allows these two features and seeing how it all interacts and how, how, you know, in my group tokens proposal, I have, you know, created some uh, significant uh, smart contracts on paper, right? Uh, uh -huh. You know, all the way down to the scripting language level, but there is no interpreter that's capable of running these scripts. I, I say to myself, you know, in the paper, I say, let us propose, you know, an op code that works like this. And this is how we would use that op code, right? So I want to actually um, implement those extra op codes um, and then start writing complicated smart contracts. So the, the group tokens, you know, is fully baked as a token system, but mm -hmm. we haven't fully baked the uh, smart contract portion of it. Okay, so here the nouns are different tokens, right? right? Mm -hmm. And how, like, how how could we boil down the the verb concept? you know, so that everyone can kind of get a sense of what you mean by that? Oh, it would be um, being able to ask any question about the current transaction. Like, um, like, um, how much Bitcoin does this transact, Bitcoin Cash, of course, right? Sometimes when I say Bitcoin, I mean, of course, Bitcoin Cash, right? Of how course. much, does, I mean, the real, the real Bitcoin, right? <laughs> how much does, um, yeah, how much Bitcoin cash does um, does this transaction pay to this address, right? Mm -hmm. And um, in terms of my, uh, you know, my ticket transfer um, thing, you would want to write a constraint that says every time this token is transferred, right, um, one percent of the BCH that is transferred in this. You know who one percent of the BCH that's transferred to the address of the the uh, the previous address of the token holder needs you know to go to this address, which is the you know the the ticket owner, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how you know a person could write a smart contract that adds a fee to every um, every you know ticket subsequent ticket transfer, right? Uh, so any question that asks something about the current transaction. Um, an, another example would be, um, uh, it's a little more esoteric, but let's say I create um, like a pool of Bitcoin cash and then a token system. And I say, okay, if you own this token, you can draw coins from the pool. So, the, so in that um, 
So the question you'd ask there about the transaction is, you know, is the number of uh, this, is the quantity of this token, right, equal to the quantity of Bitcoin cash that is being removed from a group and transferred outside of the group to an address? Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So would, so, so would that, that's basically, so you, you're nodding like you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about <laughs> backing a token with Bitcoin cash, right? So how, how can you possibly like trustlessly implement a backing system? The answer is, well, you take a pool of Bitcoin cash and you would wrap it inside a group. Okay. And it's mm -hmm. in, inside a group so that it has a contract that controls the spending of that Bitcoin cash within the group. All right. And then you can, inside that contract, you can uh, create a, a constraint and the constraint would say, okay, if a person, you know, burns, melts this amount of a token, then I will release this amount of BCH from the group. Okay. So someone could create a token and then say, put like a thousand BCH behind it and say, you know, essentially that token is backed by some, you know, proportional amount of BCH. Right. Or, or now let me uh, twist your brain a little more. Let's say we create two tokens. Okay. And the ability to draw from that pool of BCH depends on the outcome of an Oracle. And so if you own token A and the outcome of the Oracle is something you can draw from you know, the, the pool of BCH. But if the outcome of the Oracle is, you know, B, then you can only draw from the pool if, you know, the, if you own token B, okay? So now what I've done is created a decentralized prediction market where uh -huh. you can trade, you can buy and trade token A and B, right? Relative to your belief that, that the Oracle will eventually produce a statement that affirms, you know, idea A or idea B, right? And then when the Oracle finally does that, then trustlessly all of the um, participants can draw the BCH that they won from the pool. So we could have like um, BCH up and BCH down tokens, Trump wins, Trump loses tokens, yeah. things like that, right. but on right. chain, trustlessly. Totally on chain and trustlessly, other than the one you know, piece of data that needs to be imported into the blockchain, which is, you know, an affirmation by some trusted party that, you know, that, you know, Biden won the presidency, right? Mm -hmm. So when that piece of data is signed, that can be imported into the blockchain, and then all the rest is trustless, right? Um, and that's an Oracle, right? Yeah, it, it is an Oracle. And an interesting thing about the, a whole system like that is that the Oracle doesn't have anything to do with what's going on on chain. It's simply making statements, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some jurisdictions, um, what's going on might be considered wagering or betting, right? Um, and some jurisdictions have laws against that. Although, you know, if you actually read the fine print, many jurisdictions allow, you know, wagers, private wagers between two individuals, right? It's the institutionalized betting that isn't you know, is often not allowed, you know, illegal, right, on, in jurisdictions. So this would be, you know, a method, you know, to do, um, uh, you know, prediction market tokens, right? And there's, you know, and the, the entity that's signing the statement is not participating in, you know, the prediction market. The prediction market is completely decentralized, so there's no one in charge of that, right? So... Mm -hmm. Right. And also, um, that's kind of like the, um, I don't know, that's maybe the most radical, um, you know, use of this or a radical use. But here's another very uh, common one is um, a few years back, I had to uh, sell my house. Right. And um, there was some question about um, the leach field and it was winter, so they couldn't dig down and check it. Right. Uh -huh. So I had to put like uh, $20,000 in escrow just in case the leech field was bad, right? Mm. Okay, so, uh, you know, the, the real estate company said to me, uh, you know, I said, well, this is a cool, you know, service, right? Do you do this for anything? Cause I thought, heck, I'll escrow all kinds of, you know, 
things, selling old cars and things like that. They said, no way. This is way too expensive for us. The only reason why we you know, ever bother to do this is because you're selling you know, your house, right? Which is hundred, hundreds of thousand dollars. So we're going to do this, but we're essentially losing money on this $20,000 part of it, right? Well, okay. So now let's start imagining things. Let's imagine, you know, that the septic, um, some septic service company, you know, is sophisticated enough to sign statements, right? So then we could write it, you know, we could create an escrow in Bitcoin Cash, write a smart contract that says, in the springtime, when this particular septic company does its checks, it will sign a statement, right? And then mm -hmm. that statement will determine who um, who gets the uh, you know the escrow money, right? The um, op um, check data sig, or um, I originally proposed it as um, data sig verify. Uh, that essentially does that. So we have like that in a small way. But to now take that ability and sort of integrate it in with tokens and prediction markets and everything is going to require the sort of smart contracts that I'm talking about. I see. So um, sounds like this could also enable um, assassination markets, you know, which is kind of a seminal uh, idea in this field, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's an unpleasant topic, but I think that the radical libertarians in the audience will be interested in that. Uh, I could also, so oh, I, I guess, um, that would be, yeah. I mean, obviously, <laughs> you know, th there is a person who is signing. So, it, you know, if that sort of thing happened and I was, you know, the federal government or something, I would start creating, f you know, false identities and, uh, create assassination markets for everybody. And then I would, you know, uh, deliberately uh, sign them in properly, right? And to myself to steal all the money, right? So I would flood the market with, um, with you know, fraudulent, uh, because I mean, the person, you know, whoever earning the money is going to be, has to be anonymous, right? So as much as that might be the libertarian, um, I don't know, um, fantasy and other people's nightmare in practice. I don't really think you can go there. I don't know. As a bit of so. a libertarian <laughs> myself, I'm kind of actually glad that you can't go there. Um, it's not my favorite tactic, but I, I think yeah. it's, I think it's feasible. But another thing, you know, for the elaborate libertarians in the audience is I think with your escrow idea, someone could post bond. And that's like a basic starting point for the whole um Market anarchism. Yeah, but it's like a starting point for market anarchism through uh, insurance, you know, mm. Th that like everybody who's going to participate in something has to have some insurance, you know, so that they can be held accountable for any improper acts. I think that's interesting. And then you could have a third party who signs statements if you commit such an act taking your money. It's almost like slashing, maybe. Mm -hmm. And the whole Oracle thing, I mean, do you think that could turn into kind of a mechanical Turk-ish uh, workplace, you know, where people uh, get paid to, uh, to serve up accurate information to the Oracle? Yeah, definitely. And if you think about um, the idea of mortgaging your own house, right? Um, so, you know, you're sourcing your own mortgage, right? Let's, let's imagine, okay? Mm -hmm. um, what's the role of the banks in that? Well, there's a huge amount of ugly paperwork, right? And then mm -hmm. there are some actual um, important services like title research, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and like verifying to the seller, and, I mean, to the buyers of, of these, you know, bonds that there really is a house at that location and it really does have two bathrooms and so many, you know, that, you know, there are floors inside the house, right? So yeah. you could imagine like a third party service uh, who goes off and makes those attestations, right? Mm -hmm. who's, who's signed the contract, you know, signs a statement saying, yes, in fact, I did, you know, re-verify this, right? And um, 
so the whole that whole thing becomes somewhat decentralized and you know your trust in sort of that third party's service is based on um, the strength of their previous attestations all of which are publicly available on the blockchain and someone could data mine those attestations and see you know what percentage of them um, resulted in positive outcomes and what percentage resulted in negative right Mm hmm. And so this creates jobs for people, essentially. I mean, you know, looking at it from a more simplistic point of view, it creates new jobs, new uh, industry, industry opportunities. And there are opportunities where people are, people are going to get paid directly, either in BCH or some token that runs on BCH, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's talking about replacing a major chunk of the of the banking system. So let's not get too excited about it, except for maybe in the sort of, you know, second or third world uh, nations that you're talking about where those systems are already kind of corrupt and undermined. And so maybe this could be kind of like the Wikipedia in that area where lo and behold, it turns out that it's actually more accurate than, you know, the stodgy old encyclopedias that it replaced, right? That's 100% a possibility. I mean, the work of Fernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, basically demonstrated that. The mystery uh, of capital. Yeah, there you go. Ledgers of the developing book. world are broken. I love that book. That's yeah. one of my top 10 favorite books, really, of all time. So in this system, would BCH be like gas? Would there be gas in this kind of system? Um. So current proposals that you can read by me don't really have gas. And the reason why is because um, you can you can take a smart contract and even though it might be highly compressible, you, you know, it, it would like it would not be um, Turing complete. Right. There still wouldn't be loops in the sense of um, infinite capable of infinite loops. Right. You might allow loops that say loop over every output in a transaction, but there's obviously a finite number of outputs in a transaction, right? Or you might mm -hmm. say have a specific loop that says loop 10 times, but there'd be no way to say loop n times, and then I'm going to change that variable n to something else, right? So all of these um, smart contracts can basically be exploded into a single linear script right which would be kind of the size of the transaction if um it was written in you know bitcoin script today right um and then from that you can assign a uh, cost to it right based on our current um you know pricing algorithm of uh you know one satoshi per byte or whatever it is the miners choose to assign, right? I'm I'm a little bit of a fan of of having um, a graduated scale. Um, for example, a lot of people say, um, "Well, what if um, you know token transactions take over the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, right? And what mm -hmm. if it's like 99? Maybe they're going to crowd out Bitcoin Cash transactions, right?" Well, you know, I do feel like, um, you know, Bitcoin Cash is like the most important thing. We want to get people using that currency, right? And we certainly don't want token use to crowd out Bitcoin Cash. There's a simple solution, and that is to charge more Satoshis per byte for a token transaction. Mm -hmm. Right. And then based on the relative popularity, you can, you know, miners could increase, you um, the fee for token transactions to make sure that there's always a space for native Bitcoin cash transactions. Okay, so this is, I mean, this could also create new opportunities for miners, new opportunities to, to, to charge fees, right? Sure. I mean, you know, it, I personally think it's a hard sell that additional use on the blockchain is bad, right? But mm. one of the biggest uh, complaints against tokens and uh, the group tokenization that I've proposed is in fact that. It always comes up. What if tokens take over uh, the blockchain? And that's not like the craziest concept because you know we're looking at Ethereum, which has significantly more transactions than Bitcoin does, yet its price is significantly less, right? Why is that? Well, because it's carrying a lot of token value as well, right?
I don't actually see a problem though. I mean, you know, all we can do is put out the system. All we can do is put out the options. And if people choose, you know, people in like for the last couple hundred, few hundred years, like we've had monopoly currencies, you know, it's just been, you know, US dollar or Euro or whatever. I think the future, we're going to see lots of currencies. Everybody is going to have different currencies. And so if we have 200 or 5,000 different currencies running on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, so what? You know, it's still Bitcoin Cash and it's better meeting the needs of the end you. user, you know? And Bitcoin Cash is like um, the most special, you know, it's, it's what, what is it? It's, you know, it's what's what's the term um the you know the the best among equals maybe right the first first among um, equals yeah first among equals right in this case maybe the best right it will be the thing that everyone cashes out into right mm. um because it will be the the glue that that you know glues it all together right and um so you know i'm not worried about uh, you know, it's what we call a luxury problem, right? Oh, we have a problem. We have too much success. You know, if only like in the last three years, we could be worried about excessive amounts of success, right? Rather than a um, Bitcoin cash price that is declining relative to Bitcoin due to, you know, a lot of um, problems that have happened in the last three years, right? Yeah. Like, let me give you an example. We've had... Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of hard forks, right? And so I would go up to people who are only marginally, go up to a person who knows about Bitcoin Cash and is marginally sort of, you know, involved, not like a developer like me, and say, you know, name all of the awesome, you know, hard fork features that, that you know, have happened to Bitcoin Cash due to all these hard forks we've done. Yeah. <laughs> I think no they would have too. a hard time naming one of them, but don't get me wrong. There are some good features like Schnorr signatures and, you know, enabling, uh, you know, anonymous mixing of cards. Don't get me wrong, but still, if you went to a random person on the street who knew about Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash and was like, name those awesome features, right? You know, we spent a lot of time doing janitorial work. Hmm. Yeah. And I think really, um, you know, as I asked you earlier in the stream, you know, what I think or in the video, what I th what you think the vibe is right now, I feel like the vibe is pretty quiet in Bitcoin Cash. And I feel mm -hmm. like we need to make some bold moves in 2021 in a few different areas. You know, I'm I, I, I hope that I can contribute in large part to the bold moves in in uh, in marketing and in uh, and in vision, you know. But I think we need uh, some bold moves in governance also and in uh, in tech. And I think your proposal could be among the top three bold moves that we have because, you know, if you look at the market, like everybody wants the price of Bitcoin cash to go up. And I always say, you know, like, don't focus on that first because that's that's just going to lead you down a bad path. But um, if you look at what increases the price on other cryptos, it's major new technological developments. And use and, of that. Yes. And we need this. And we, I think. And so you do you still call this proposal op group or is it something bigger than op group? Or what, what do you call it? Oh, so, okay. So just as a summary, what I titled entitled op group is like version one. Okay. And it was written... Mm -hmm. Um, to get the idea was in you know 2017 we were having a the whole industry was having a huge token mania right so the intention was to get something out real fast that perhaps wasn't fully featured right it didn't support like uh, sub tokens and things like that so now the this, the next version is what I call group tokenization okay uh, and so that is kind of the full featured version so at this point we wouldn't don't look at op, don't say op group right just think of that as like the ancestor and since so much time has passed we've had the chance to implement you know stuff so this is group tokenization then yes okay and so earlier the idea is minor validated tokens right 
minor validated um, tokens. Yeah, which are different than um, like SLP tokens, which, um, you know, have shown like use in Bitcoin Cash and there has been excitement and everything, but they haven't really caught on, right? They just, they didn't catch for three years, right? Hmm. Um, let me read you a quote from the SLP token um, uh, original white paper, okay? It, okay. It reads like this. In a perfect world, miners would validate token transactions, bringing the full Bitcoin security model to tokens. However, this would require a protocol change like with the group proposal. So that quote is from the SLP token white paper. Hmm. So, you know, the authors of SLP tokens at the time were aware that in a perfect world, you would have what we call minor validated tokens, right? Hmm. So like, imagine going in front of a VC and, you know, you pitch something and they're like, well, why don't you use the perfect tokens, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. go, go use this other blockchain. Like, you know, a VC doesn't care what blockchain gets used. Right. Right. Go, go use this other blockchain with the perfect tokens. Don't use the one with the imperfect tokens. Right. You know, I mean, it's true. We're, it's we're very true. shooting ourselves in the foot here. Right. You know, because you have to like if Bitcoin Cash was wildly popular, then people might use in, in you know, less perfect technology to get on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. Right. But if you need to use a technology to draw people in to a blockchain, it's got to be the best. Right. Otherwise, people will go somewhere else, use something else. Um, I, I do not know what the process is for getting something adopted in, in Bitcoin cash right now. Um, and um, so, you know, I think we do have some developer meetings and people talk, but there hasn't been any sort of understanding of how you would go the next step. Um, I think it's meant to be kind of like a, I don't know, a consensus needs to be achieved, I, you know, as a more formal, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited has a more formal decision making process. So obviously I would be in favor of something a little bit more formal. Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, things that um, are in the way of such an adoption, um, I think that, um, you know, there are very much still people who believe that, um, you know, the blockchain should be for Bitcoin Cash only. And, um, you know, we don't want to sort of waste blockchain space. And, uh, you know, if we only stopped innovating on, you know, the, the base level and we all started working on at the wallet level, then adoption would come are the arguments that I've heard. And there are, you know, I think non-trivial numbers of people who still believe that. The, part of the reason why I asked you to, you know, think about asking people what features have happened, you know, have occurred in Bitcoin Cash in the last three years is I think we've been doing that for the last three years, effectively. We've been not having features fr from the end user perspective. They're not seeing features in Bitcoin Cash. So for people who argue, well, if we just stop, you know, the hard forks, then the, the um, adoption would come. Personally, I think from the outside perspective, there hasn't been much change. So I don't believe in that. Argument. Right. This is where, yeah, and this is where we, the developers need to provide you the technologies so that you don't have to go out and sell this product like convince people to use it even when they don't really have a problem. You, you'd need to be, you know, marketing people should be reduced to awareness only, right? So, but to give an example, I agree with you. And so Bitcoin Unlimited has, you know, a beta quality um, phone wallet that I personally work on. Kind of looks like that, right? Yeah, Wally wallet, yeah. So, but one thing that I've done, which I haven't seen anyone else do in, in the wallet is there's a little shopping button right there. And if you click on shopping, it just gives you like two or three choices. I would love to have a bunch more, but you can use e-gift or gift cards and menu fee there, right? And then the map of stores, which of course just goes to bitcoin.com. So then you can just click on menu fee, right? And then it pops up menu fee and you know, you order, right? 
So I agree with you, the wallet should be integrated to uses, right? And, and payment things. So I was trying to make that easy with Wally. Um, but, you know, I'm not running out there like pushing Wally as a wallet right now because I want to see, I don't want to have to sell Wally as a wallet. What I want is people to come to Bitcoin Cash saying, where's my wallet that does this? And then I just say, well, here it is, it's Wally, right? So until I, um, so until Wally effectively sells itself, it's always just going to be kind of hidden, you know? Um, I'm on tele. I'm in all the the main uh, Telegram chats, and of course, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited forums, and also Bitcoin Unlimited Telegram chats, and you know my email address is out there. So, um, if anyone wants to talk to me, then uh, I'm sure you can find me um, and other members of Bitcoin Unlimited. If you're more, in if you're interested in um, you know, more information about what these new technologies that I'm fooling around with. And uh, there's a website, uh, nextchain.cash, whose purpose is like an experimental, you know, Bitcoin Cash blockchain. Um, and it just has like a whole bunch of features um, implemented that you can play with. You know, group tokens is implemented uh, pretty solid because uh, group tokens is deployed in um, some altcoin. Uh, ion, um, but then other stuff, you know, is totally uh, in the midst of being implemented right now. So, you know, it's completely an engineering, fun, hacking blockchain, right? Uh, test test network. So you could go there and look it out. 